The following interview was conducted with uh, J.P. Lysak, Professor Emeritus of Technology and the Director Emeritus of the Office of Manpower Studies for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, June the 16th, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you, Thank Catherine. you. My pleasure. Glad to be here. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in your early years. Well, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, in a nice area called Roseland. I visit them even now, once in a while. And that was 90 years ago. <laughs> and I was raised there and went through high school there. And um, what was Tell us about your early schooling and also high school. What was it like yeah, when the, you were there? Uh, I went to a Catholic elementary school for the eight grades, and I went to the high school. And I, uh, while in high school, I joined the military through the National Guard. I when you were in high school? Fibbed a little about my age and um, really liked the military. I was in the ROTC. In high school? Yes. And that's what set me off on a military career as well as any technical field. But the military came first. I just liked that. I was on the rifle team and the uh, uh, saber team, and, and uh, I just hit it off. And that was the beginning, really, of my interest in the military. Okay. Tell us a little bit about how they happen to have an ROTC in high school. Oh, they have junior, uh, they okay. call it junior ROTC. Okay. They have four years, and um, I, I liked it. And I, when I was a senior in high school, I joined the Illinois National Guard. Again, fibbing a little about my age. And that was the start of my military career, okay. sort of. Okay. In high school, were you in any other student uh, organizations and uh, while you were there? Well, I was... Uh, Cadet Colonel of the Chicago ROTC unit. And uh, immediately after leaving high school, I figured my career ought to be military. I really liked it. And uh, as a result, I'm one of seven children. Dad said it's pretty questionable about everyone going to college. And I heard that the Army Air Corps had an engineering school. So I looked it up in Chinook Air Force Base, uh, at that time, Army Air Corps Base, was where the School of Aeronautical Engineering Maintenance was. So I went there. And they said, if you have good grades and pass our physical and mental tests, we can enroll you immediately into our next aircraft engineering program here at Chinook Air Force Base. Well, that was great because it was kind of what I was, you know, looking for. The only catch was, and I still have to smile when I tell it, the uh, director said, we'll give you some tests, some science and some English tests and so forth, and then you have to pass the physical tests. He says, if you pass the physical tests and don't pass the mental tests, you're, you're going to have to join the Army to go through this process so you'll be a private in the Army, Army Air Corps at that time. Well, that was, that kind of shook me up. <laughs> and I said, boy, I don't know uh, uh, if I should do that then. And he says, well, the new class starts soon and um, I'll come to a deal with you. If you pass it, you will enroll and not spend our time now with this. And I said, Absolutely. I'm, I'm for engineering and I'd like to come here and whatever. And to make a long story short, I made it and went through and that was the beginning of my U.S. Army Air Corps. Okay. I went through their engineering school in aeronautics there at Chanute Air Force Base. How long was it a program? A couple of years or four years? or The program in the, at Chanute there, mm -hmm. it was two years. Okay. It was a two-year program. And um, I have uh, 31 years with the Army Air Corps and the United States Air Force. Very good. And they were good enough. While I was in the Air Force, I, they sent me to Ohio State and I got my d advanced degrees. I went to the Air University. I went through the Armed Forces Staff College, so that education took care of itself right along. I ended up with a doctorate. And uh, the thing is, 
when I went to these schools, I didn't determine which school I would go to or what I was study. I was told, but they were all they were all in aeronautical or maintenance engineering and something right. I liked. Okay. I became an aircraft crew member uh, with heavy bombers as well as being in the maintenance engineering side. Did you were you a pilot? Did you fly the planes? Or? No, I was an engineering uh, officer, and I did the flight tests and I did the uh, supervision of maintenance. Um, I was a gunner during the war as well as a flight engineer for, you know, mm -hmm. but then they said uh, they were short of um, uh, engineering maintenance officers so I couldn't fly anymore because <laughs> they didn't want to lose me. Sure. That was okay with me. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about what you, your service during the war. This is World War II? Yeah, I was en route to the Philippine Islands uh, Clark Air Force Base when the Japanese struck it. And, uh, 1941? In 41. And they hit, um, uh, of course, Hawaii at the same time. So uh, I was caught between Hawaii and the Philippine Islands, and the Japanese destroyed our base there. It was Clark Air Force Base. I never made it there. So, but we. Um, finally landed in Australia and we operated against the Japanese from Australia. The, uh, I was with heavy bombers all the time and uh, as the war progressed we moved from uh, 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 Hawaii, I was, I was there just a short time and I went through the um, uh, oriental uh, combat area to help when Chiang Kai-shek was being moved down the coast. And uh, we flew there, we, we flew with the uh, Chinese Air Force, and then uh, Rommel broke loose in the North African desert against the British Eighth Army, so we then deployed to North Africa, and we supported the British Army, uh, Eighth Army, against uh, uh, North Africa. So I was in the uh, Asian and the uh, Mediterranean and in the uh, North African theaters, mm -hmm. mostly during the war, during the war yeah. until we came up through Italy. I never did, the other guys were lucky, they were flying out of England where they had a nice facility, but we had field <laughs> Air Force bases all the way. Sure. But that was my uh, military career. Well, and then what, what was next after the war? What did you, what was your next move? Well. Uh, when I was still in the military, I was uh, in the Pentagon as a staff officer, and the Army Air Corps at that time had a um, educational commission that determined educational requirements for officers, and we sent officers all over to the universities in the United States. And there was a commission that determined how many we needed, were, what universities they should go, and what subject they studied, would study. And um, I was put on that committee. And we had advisors from the major universities all over the country help us determine what programs we could send officers to to increase their education, both to help the service and, of course, that fit into the civilian educational right. framework. And we had a good program, so I was on that committee, and it so happened one evening when I was having dinner with uh, the committee, which was made up of not only Air Force officers, but representatives from a lot of the universities, because we send, and still do, many officers to universities for various programs continuously, sure. as well as our military schools. And a member of the Educational Advisory Committee of the universities was Dr. Lashi, Charles Lashi. Did you remember the name? Yes. yes. And one evening after a meeting, we were sitting together. I had made a presentation to the committee, and he said to me, JP, uh, um, what are you going to do when you get out of the service? I said, I'm not sure yet. He says, well, we could use you at Purdue. And it was uh, by accident we were sitting together that evening and had dinner. I said, are you serious? He said, yes, I'm serious. But I was a colonel, 
and the next grade is a general. And the, I said, uh, Dr. Lashi, if I'm on the general's list, there ain't nothing going to stop me. I'm going to continue. But if I'm not on it, I just might be interested to come to Purdue. And that's how I was introduced to Purdue. Okay. I called him. I said, the list came out. I'm not on it. Are you still interested? He said, well, come here and we'll set up a committee and we'll see whether you can. So I came here and was appointed as an associate professor in the School of Technology. Okay. The school was established by at that time? Yes, it was established by okay. that time. It was just growing. It was not a college then of, of technology. But it fit in well because I'd studied maintenance engineering and I'd had uh, 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 my advanced degrees and I went to the military armed forces staff college. I, I had the background, I thought, to, to, to come here. What year was this that you came to Purdue? 1965. Okay, all right. I was in the Air Force on June 30th and on the 1st or 2nd of July I was an associate professor at Purdue. <laughs> okay. Well tell us about when you first came here and you, is this where the, did you come for the manpower studies? Was that oh, yes. part of the appointment? Or yes, appointment? Um, I was um, interested right from the outset, uh, even in the Air Force, I work with the classification of officers. Um, at that time, uh, the Air Force has always been moving fast with high technology, and we were having difficulties matching officers and their educational backgrounds with specific jobs to make sure that, they, as well as their rank, coincided so the best assignment both for the career of the officer as well as the service within the Air Force. So I worked up the system with the codes that masks, the, uh, outline all the tasks and the knowledge performed at the various military occupations and the type of education and the level for each. And I coded that so the computer could work that out. And as a result of that, I worked with the universities so uh, Dr. Lashi said, we could use that h here at Purdue because then it was all codified and in uh, computers to uh, match it. And I, I, I worked with the definition of tasks for commonality in terms of uh, types of uh, positions where the qualifications and the tasks to be performed were coded and so was the education and the um, experience of officers so we could match. And the best officer at the right rank could then go into the right area uh, to both progress in his career and fulfill the task right. that he's going to. So I was responsible for setting that up. So Dr. Lausche said, we could use you. Right. <laughs> When you came, did they tell you what the manpower study? This was a new unit. Uh, it was, I, w I was you the were father right. in 1965. It that's didn't right. exist at Purdue until that's then. The, that's what I've read, exactly. Yeah. And then there were, well, tell us a little bit about that, what was the purpose of it, and then many of your research studies, their focus was, was manpower as well as education. So let's talk a little bit about the studies and things that you've done over well, time. It, it occurred to me that many of the programs at Purdue were based on the workforce requirements that were posted from the Workforce Development Division in uh, Indianapolis. Well, it seemed to me that a freshman coming into university to receive some uh, good uh, uh, guidance in terms of the future should not only know what the uh, work situation was and the job opportunities were at that time because it was four years before he was even out. So I was saying that what we need in the first instance is a good solid projection of occupations and qualifications in occupations in the whole spectrum uh, of the professional area. And uh, we didn't have it. So that was, they created Manpower Studies Office, which was, which uh, the equivalent at Indianapolis was workforce development <laughs> uh, personnel. So uh, that was my job, and I was um, 
instrumental then in the projection, 10-year projections, of each occupation by type and skill requirements and educational requirements. Because to advise the freshman what to get into or what facilities are needed, you really had to make these projections. And there, there was some good projection work being done by the Commission of Higher Education and the um, uh, uh, De Workforce Development Division. It still exists in, in Indianapolis. So I worked with them so that at Purdue we could do it and we based the School of Technology, what programs we had, what courses we had, and then I even studied the industries like in South Bend and down in the southern part of the state, so that our branch campuses not only reflected the curricula that we had here, but were possible with the specialized courses you, that were unique to the industry and occupation of that region. And uh, I then recommended the branch campuses, where they were to be located, and what programs should be there. But those were based on projections uh, by occupation, because by the time you got established, got it going, and, and whatever. Were, were the, what regional campuses existed when you first came? Was there... Um... Well, we only had two or three branch campuses, okay. and I was in on the planning of the remaining branch campuses Does, throughout the state. So was Calumet, was that uh, operable? And what about North Central? And yes. then and yes. IUPUI didn't exist at that time, no, did it? No, uh -huh. no, no. So, and, and also, um, we try to make the programs such that the curriculum programs reflected the regional needs, too. Not only for if, uh, developing a person for a good professional area where there were opportunities, but reflected also the needs of the region. And that gave us big support. The industries were all for it, you know. Oh, sure, sure. And, uh, and we didn't tailor make it, but we definitely favored programs that were comparable to the types of industries. And that gave us their support. And the other thing is these kids lived there, went to school there, and many got opportunities there. So it was a, the, our branch campuses, which didn't exist before, were right. just exploded. Right. right. And, it, and uh, they're still going. <laughs> That's right. Did you project on a national, were you looking at jobs not only within uh, the local or regional, but also national? Oh, we looked at the, oh okay. yes. So your projections included that? Oh yes, oh okay. yes. Uh, the biggest job was the 10-year projection, as well as the current situation sure. by occupation and skill level in industry. So um, there was very good projections done by the Workforce Development Division of Indianapolis. So I went down there and I started to work with them. And they were doing a rather good job. And I was impressed by the fact that they'd been doing it now maybe 15, 16 years. And when they made a projection, what they always did was after a few years went by, they compared it to what they said it was and what it really was and they found where there were mismatches, why there were mismatches. And we finally got down to a pretty fine art. For example, if you have an occupation that's been an old occupation, you probably have older people in it, from newcomers to those ready to retire. But in a new advancing technology, you had a lot of new people come in, and the attrition rate through death and retirement was low and the growth was there, so the projections were not the same for these various occupations. So the problem was, how do you figure out for each occupation where we are and where we're going into the future? And then, after you do it a few years, you go back and say, now what did I say and what is it and where did, we frankly blew it in some areas. We said, where do we make the mistake? So we got to be pretty good on projections too now. That's good. And we're doing that today. That's very good. Yeah. And you did, um, you, one thing, you did some people should keep on top of how their jobs are changing. And that was part of your uh, work that you had done too. Um, it costs money, we'll have to do it the rest of our lives. Yeah. How were the computers, and they, they changed over time for you, doing well, this work, the greatly. data gathering? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the interesting thing is, I have personally, and I think I'm 
I, I verified it, although sometimes it's being questioned. I'm moving away from education for specialized fields. The fields are changing so fast. We need people more with a background and the fundamentals to move in various areas. See, until I think a few years ago, we were specialized, and that worked fine. You got your field, and you worked in it, you were good in it. But now, very rarely do you have real work in a specialized field, because we teamwork. It's all united. It's innovative with others. And, and therefore, I move back to a solid foundation from which you can go to specialized areas. But the foundation was first, because the cost to update or change is much, much easier as time goes on if that foundation is there. So we moved from specialization to a general foundation and then build on it, which of course wasn't popular in some cases, because some professors w wanted to be specialized right from the beginning. Okay. Understand. I, w I, I had an occasion, my, my first wife, she's gone now, um, was a nurse. And I was talking to uh, uh, her friends and whatever about nurses' training. They didn't have enough of them, and they wanted to know if I had any advice on how do you go about really figuring what they need and how do you get people interested in whatever. And although that wasn't my field, I, I, I helped uh, where I could. But it was interesting how they changed from when you went into nursing, you started basically with some um, biology and some anatomy and, and some physical uh, uh, oriented uh, programs, which did not include, which I, I was secondary in recommending. These girls didn't see anybody die or didn't see suffering in a hospital and whatever until they're almost their second year. And I said, I don't believe that's right. A part of when you decide to be a nurse ought to be a introduction into this is what a nurse does. This is, you're working with dying people. You're working with people in pain. You're working in a job where you don't make mistakes or whatever. And if you, you ought to know that before you're in your second year, sure, right. you know, because they were finding girls in their second year. It was the first time they went into a hospital and really got involved. So uh, I, I, I was uh, kind of helpful in that, but my first wife was a nurse, so that, that's right. my association there, and I still am very interested in that field because we are, it's growing in its technicalities, its importance, and we don't have enough. That's right. We don't have enough. There's always it's a big shortage. Yeah. yeah. Right. And getting young men interested in it now, that, mm -hmm. that's necessary. Right, yeah. Um, you also did, um, you did some other stuff. Did you do projections for personnel or was it primarily for students and industries and uh, enrollment and as far as going to college is concerned? Well. Is that the main focus? No, I, I did it for the whole spectrum of okay. manpower for every industry. Okay. emphasizing those that we have in Indiana mostly. See what's happened in Indiana that people don't realize. It wasn't long ago that the biggest economic sector in our state was the manufacturing of automobiles and its parts. Right. Well, it isn't anymore. Right. It isn't anymore. The second was the manufacturing of steel. It isn't anymore. Now, the changes that I'm talking about are very, very important right. because uh, um, the people in those industries were fighting to keep going and they wanted good people and they wanted education to do it. And I was trying to look ahead and say if Indiana, which is losing this sector of manufacturing, is going to be successful, it's going to have to get into, for example, uh, the biology, the the life sciences area, that was growing faster than the manufacturing of automobiles and their parts because even Detroit was finding that it was being done with parts being bought overseas that were shipped and we were globalizing, you know, and whatever. 
So it was a big shift in Indiana to move from automobiles and their parts into a more innovative and a uh, life sciences, pharmaceutical and other. And we had Lilly and, and Zimmer and those companies were there and they're fighting, but we were so manufacturing oriented, we didn't give them much priority. Sure. So one of my jobs was to, you know, sell that. And I was not popular because the people who were teaching it in the schools that had the biggest sectors were, were in effect saying, we don't have enough money to do it. And I said, the solution is prioritize everything you're doing. And if you have high priority items that you're not funding, you just cut off the bottom and you take that funding and you move it where you really need it. Well, when you do that, you're not popular. Yeah. You know, right. you're popular with the people that are growing, but you're, you know, sure. so um, I wasn't the most popular guy yeah, on campus. <laughs> Did you Sometimes. work with the uh, Commission of Higher Education? And oh, I work with them all okay. the time. Right. Every move we made had to be approved by them. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, and it was um, good people there. Right. So yeah. the commission was striving also to get into the area where we were more innovative and in, in, in team-oriented rather than specialized sure. in, in, in area. So I was on their frequency and we got along very well. Right. You were saying earlier that when you first came, uh, you uh, had helped with the Kanoi Hall. We'd share a couple comments on that. You were in a different building when you first came because Kanoi Hall did not exist for the researchers, which is where the College of Technology is located. Well, we were in the old girls' quarters, <laughs> South Campus Courts. <laughs> Where but the I best still, school is today? I still kid, kid about it. I had a better office then than there because I had what used to be a girls' dormitory. I said, I had my own bathroom, I had my own room, I had my own window, you know. But it's South Campus Course. Okay. I says now I got a brick wall, you know, and so forth. But yeah, that we were on South Campus Course, and our classes were in all of the buildings, and we didn't have Kanoi. Right. You had to do a lot of traveling around campus. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and you you also did some projections for how higher education would increase. You did some of that, of course, as yes. well. Yes. Yes. Um, that's a key report. Yeah, it's it, uh, it, it's interesting that in that case, although it's more difficult, it's more expensive and whatever, there's more assistance because usually the professions have their own societies or their professional organizations, and they are very rich in terms of what their profession does. In fact, part of the, their dues goes to pay for professionals that in that area that can't find jobs. Sure. So the best place to go is into the profession that you're talking about setting up a program or whatever. And they cooperated fully. Sure. Of course, what they want to do is impress you that you really should be doing it, yeah. whatever. But they were very frank in some cases where they were overproducing because things change, things change. And in that profession, with their s particular organizations, they defended that. Well, you have to break out of that. You have to look and at to the look society at and the total needs, you sure. know. Right. And, and um, uh, I don't blame it. I mean, it's your profession. You've been trained for it. You're specialized. You're good. And someone comes along and says, that's changing. You're, you're, you know, you're less specialized. You're more team now. And you're more in these areas. And then you have to get people that are well trained and that are looking ahead to be a part of which way they go, right. which they don't. Right, yeah. And of course you have resistance. Some people, especially people that are not as well trained, that see the new, more difficult advances in their profession that they have to do to keep up. That's a challenge. It's a challenge. Challenged individually. Because, and it moves faster and faster um, all the time, Catherine. I know. It yeah. feeds on itself. Knowledge feeds on itself. And you have to keep moving. Right. And sometimes as we get older, we know what we're doing. We want to keep doing what we're doing. and <laughs> The challenge even gets greater. It's challenging. <laughs> 
Right. Yeah. Uh, give us some. T uh, you've done some teaching. Give us any tips or challenges when you were doing teaching. I didn't any, hear you. Teaching or any tips or ta challenges? Because you've done some teaching certainly over time. The students that you're working with the students. I don't understand. Um, you were doing. You taught some courses while you've been oh, here. Oh yes. And t any tips and things or working with the students? Any comments on that? Yeah. Um, I I find that. Uh, students today um, accept challenges more so than in the past. I think in the past we had a curriculum and we had an outline and we knew what we we're teaching out of the book, you know, and it was pretty well set. But it's different today. I think more there's give and take and there are uh, uh, different interests of, uh, of different students. And the main thing now isn't laying out the curriculum and the requirements and the forcing them to, to, to meet the requirements as it is to challenge them to want to learn, to want to move forward. And th that's happening more now. I see that in students. Sure. They're pushing now, a lot of them, if they're in the right area. We did have some problems, and they still happen. I still remember a few conversations in my office uh, generally, uh, I'll, I'll describe a si general situation. Uh, a young man will come in and say, uh, I'm in uh, mechanical engineering technology. My dad is a mechanical engineer. He wants me to be an engineer. He's paying for me to be uh, a mechanical engineering uh, student, and I hate it. What will I do? I've had a few of those. Because Dad says it's a good feel, I know what I'm saying, and he might even have a business where he wants his son to fit in, you know, and whatever. So I, I've had that kind of uh, uh, thing that comes in where it's very difficult to handle. Sure. And I, I uh, usually say, tell Dad the truth, and that you did talk to, to people about it who say the chances of success in a profession are very much related to how much you like it, how much you really want to be in it. So if you don't want to be an engineer and dad's one, he wants you to say that I, I, I probably could be more successful if you already in this or this or that field. Be very honest with it and, and discuss it with him. But I said uh, uh, in the final analysis you have to consider his opinion very seriously. Sure. Because a lot of dads say, "I've got this company. I need this, and I think you ought to, and I think you're going to do it, and you can move right in." It. It's set, and the kid says, "I hate it." Well, it's difficult. I don't want to get between a student and his father, or his parents. But uh, if he says he's far more likely to be successful if he's doing something he likes to do and wants to do, and then move from that forward, sure, right. uh, dad will be. I'm sure as reasonable right. as under the circumstances. Every every circumstance is different. Right. Uh, one thing was that tell us a little about that introduction to Purdue's academic programs that you taught with Ken Coleman. Is that course still being taught? Yeah. And what was the nature of that course? Well, um, the uh, we were moving toward nanotechnology and some new courses which didn't fit into the laboratories we had and the, and the standards that we had. So the only solution I knew, because uh, they're all over my head, all, you can't know all about these things, see. So uh, my, my uh, part in it largely was try to set up, sometimes informally, sometimes a committee, to look at it with people that had had experience in it and that people who were willing to participate in going out and uh, 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 testing what they're coming up with by having for each program an industrial advisory committee. Bring in the people from the industries for which you believe these people are moving. Experienced people who are willing to spend time to come in and say, what are you doing, why are you doing it, what I think about it. And I said, that will help. You'll get support from them. Right. You'll have summer jobs for the kids and maybe jobs. 
And sure enough, a lot of our kids that go out now to get some funds, hopefully, through summer employment, end up on graduation with the company that did their summer work with. So it's working beautifully. Yeah, right. So and we are surveying all of the employers we can get to. Good. You got Johnny Jones. What What do you think of Johnny? What's right? What are we doing wrong? Where is his weakness? What, you know, how can we improve it? And I re still remember one letter I got when we first started it because it's getting their name and address and soliciting their cooperation, whatever, it took a little time and whatever. And I, I used one letter to stimulate everybody, one uh, in a pretty good size employer. The first thing, I had a set letter that asked for the reply. He wrote on it, JP, I didn't know you gave a damn. And he came right back with a full cooperation. <laughs> And I thought that was worthwhile. So <laughs> when anybody was complaining, I would read that to them. <laughs> uh, you did some outreach, I think, with uh, Caterpillar Tractor, and I mention that because it's a, a company here in town. You've, are you still doing doing that? Or Not no? now. Okay. And I did uh, a lot of consulting with General Motors. Okay. Yeah, and you were I an adjunct professor there. I taught there courses. One time. Right. Yeah, for both. Uh, but now, uh, in fact, that stopped long ago. My uh, uh, re commitments here were just too much and all the traveling back and forth. I do no consulting now, whatever, but I did consulting. And it was good because uh, I used to tell them it keeps my feet wet, you know. <laughs> I know what's going on, you know, and so sure. forth. And, it's, uh, and the nice thing, too, is they appreciate the fact that they have it. And, of course, you're familiar with TAP, right. the Technical Assistant Program. So uh, if they don't know about it, I can tell them about those things. And they, it's, I think our um, liaison and uh, association with industries is very good at Purdue through the TAP program right. and others. Which has grown over time. And our research programs. Right. Yeah, right. That's, I, I, that's over my head. I'm not a part of that. Yeah. I like the idea we have research, we have development, we have education. And it's integrated. Right. That's good. Works and well. I think that Purdue does it real well. Right. Yeah. How has the campus changed since you came in 65? We've got more buildings here. The facilities have changed, haven't they? Oh, yes. Right. Yeah, we keep growing. And the modernization of our labs and whatever is very impressive. Right. I mm -hmm. go in some of the labs now and I can see some of the new equipment and stuff that I wish I had time <laughs> right. I could sit in a corner and listen to some <laughs> instructor. Oh, and Chauncey Village has changed over time, hasn't it? Pardon? Chauncey Village has changed over time. Chauncey Village, since you've been here. You know, the village has changed a lot. Yes. Yeah. I don't know much yeah, about that. Yeah, but more stores and more more traffic, I think. Oh, since yes. Then, right? oh, yeah. oh yeah. yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Let's talk a little bit about your awards and honors. You got a Sagamore of the Wabash. Congratulations. Yeah, thank Was that you. a, did it, did it come as a surprise, or how did that that Come sure on. was a big surprise. Good. Um, there were a couple of um, problems that the Indiana Workforce Development Division was working on, and they're pretty serious. And some of them were related to union management relations. And I was lucky in that I worked in a, a situation with the uh, General Motors and the United Workers. And they had me teach courses to both management and to union officials and employees. And I said, I'll teach courses, but I want them both in the same class. I don't want to separate them because uh, uh, what's, what's missing is the teamwork often. And uh, when, when, when I talk to uh, some of the employers and the employees, and today it's a problem that I, I, I work with, but there's no easy solution. It goes like this. In the United Auto Workers, for example, seniority is key as a union member. If I've been 10 years and you've been five, I'm senior and I should get the better job when it's available and so forth. 
and seniority was very important because I did have more experience or whatever. But as the technology advanced, especially in electronics, electricity, and in some high pressure plumbing and steam and whatever, some of the younger people coming in were much better educated and had a better foundation than some of the old guys who just didn't keep up to date. And, they, and uh, like when I was talked to, <laughs> he said, JP, they want to send me the course. And I looked at some of that stuff and it had a little algebra in it. And he says, when I was in high school, algebra was Greek and it's still Greek and I'm not going to go to it, you know. And you have that. Hard, yeah. I've got 20 years. It's, I'm a loyal employee. I don't drink. I get my job done. And now these youngsters are coming in there and taking over. And I said, yeah, because we now have a roboticized line. We had an automaticity here. We have reprogrammed machines now. And you don't want to go to the training program. They said, no, if I, if I go there, I might flunk. I got 20 years and a good record. I'm not going to some program. So I've been working real hard on not putting people into program unless you first test what are the fundamentals you need to be successful in that program and test the applicant or the person to go in to make sure they're at a reasonable chance of success in the program before they go in. Right. Because otherwise you're going to have this rift that's going to get sure. wider and wider. Because in a union, seniority is the key. In a highly technological advancing economy, that's not the key. Right. Your knowledge and your skill is the key, and your ability to not only do that job, but to innovate. We want people that can not only do the job, but advance that job, move ahead. And when it changes, the money and time it costs you to make that employee successful is directly related to that foundation that's there. So employees now don't, in the past, we used to do a task analysis. What do you need to know and what do you need to do to get that job done? And we try to hire somebody for that. That's out. Now it's, does this person have the capability to be retrained and upgrade at the least cost to me and maybe even innovate and advance? So the whole idea is shifted. Sure. And the middle-aged guy that doesn't have a pretty good education, is he's f in the crunch right today. That's right, that's right. Well, about the Sagamore, so that was, the, and you also were a, an honorary lieutenant governor of Indiana. Yeah. That's pretty nice. Well, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, it's a kind of they, a nice they, thing. They, they just made a mistake, I guess. <laughs> you can sit next to him and, you know, kibitz yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I was, I was at a, at a, at a state meeting one day, and I was, they called me in advance and said, are you going to be there by chance? I said, yeah, I'm going to be there. I said, well, that's great. And that's when they called me up and, and made me a Sagamore, the Wabash, and a, then another time the honorary lieutenant governor of the state. I had no idea that's, <laughs> that's happening. But I, I work with state all the time. Sure, right. I want the state to know that uh, we're very concerned with the state economy. And I know that Indiana citizens are paying for this institution, and they deserve to be served in terms of their problems in their future. Sure, right. And when I say these things and I do things, the guys upstairs sometimes, you know, <laughs> give you a little pat on the back. <laughs> well, I want to congratulate you. You got the first Distinguished Service Award from the College of Technology. Congratulations. Thank you very, very much. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. That nice. was a... A uh, real surprise to me. Or, or, uh, tell us about the event, though, when you got it. Well, I, I, I keep. I think they know I'm 90 years old, and I don't have too many years. And they want to be nice to me. That's all. Oh, <laughs> was it at a special event, and and you were there? They yeah. made, made sure you oh, were there, right? Oh, it was right? a grand. Yeah. It was a grand dinner. Yeah, that's yeah. very nice. Yeah. And so now in retirement, you've been. You kept, tell us a little about what you've been doing in retirement. You're still pretty active within the school. But what you're still saying? fairly active with the school since you've been retired from Purdue? Every day. I come okay. in every day. Okay. And uh, I still do projections, manpower studies. I serve on various committees. I give lecture now and then. Um, I try to bring in new information for 
various programs. Uh, the dean uh, occasionally has requests for information, and I still have contacts, you know, with the commission and with the so you can obtain workforce it. development. And I often know the name of the person or, or somewhere to go uh, to help get the information. So I come in every day, and um, uh, like uh, uh, today, I am finishing a rather interesting development. We have been importing manufacturing goods from China for a long time, slowly eroding our manufacturing base because their cost of labor is much la lower. And we have been globalizing, and companies have been buying parts, you know, and whatever, and uh, uh, it's costing jobs. But the interesting thing is, when I studied the statistics, and just yesterday and today I finished a paper on it, what's happening to energy costs? You know what's happening. It's tripling. And China <laughs> has to ship all that stuff to us. And a lot of times they need the materials to manufacture, manufacture it and send it to us so that a low cost of labor is being defrayed because of the huge costs of energy going there and back and the time element. And lo and behold, a lot of the factories that have lost through globalization products that are made in Japan are finding now they can compete with a lower cost because the stuff doesn't have to be shipped then and shipped back. Because largely energy, it's really, mm -hmm. I'm talking about 30, 40 percent increase in a few years. Sure. So that's, that's encouraging. So I just wrote a paper, it's on my desk now, and, and about the fact that this is encouraging to us and keep it up because we, it's demoralizing to be in a factory and find out that they're going to now make it in China. Okay. And now some of the statistics show shipping the stuff there or shipping it all back here, the time and whatever, means even if we have a higher wage here, the time element isn't in, we're getting it back. Right. And I think that's encouraging. Certainly and is. I want to tell our people, stay in there, hang in there, do your job, innovate, because we're not out of this fight. Right. A lot of people thought, gee, when they get only, or in Mexico even, mm -hmm. we can. And uh, energy is one of the things on our, our side. People say energy is bad, it's costing us more and more. I says, no, it's good. Because <laughs> people now in China have to pay for all that. That's right. So yeah. it's, uh, I just finished a paper that's on good. it that's going to be circulated here oh, good. next week. How about an outstanding event in your life? Can you something come to mind? Outstanding event in your life? Oh yeah, I've had a lot. I've been blessed. Well, I left San Francisco going to Clark Air Force Base in 1941. To Clark Air Force Base. I served a period there. It's, it's on the main island uh, in uh, uh, in the Philippines, and I served a, a tour duty in, in at Clark Air Force Base, and we were headed there. We landed in um, uh, Hawaii, Hickam, and we're about to take off for Clark when the Japanese bombed it. If I had been there two year, two days earlier, I would have been on that base. It was demolished, and the people who weren't killed were captured, and their families were there, and the Japanese took them. And we were hearing all kinds of stories. Hmm. But see, I was in Hawaii, and I thought, how lucky. I mean, it was that close. When I'd have been in Clark, nobody got out. 
if they didn't kill you, they had you as a prisoner. So we didn't get back to Clark, you see, in two and a half years. So when you people talk about what happened in my life and things, something like just a few days, one day or another, may, may, made the difference. Right. Right. Hmm. And also, uh, uh, after the war started, when, when I was actually en route to Clark when, when it started, as I said, I ended up in Australia. And we operated then looking for Japanese submarines and stuff. And then Chiang Kai-shek was coming down the coast, so we bolstered him. And then Rangoon was being lost, so we went to help defend that. And then Rommel broke loose in the desert against the British Eighth Army in North Africa, so we went there to, to help Montgomery against Rommel. So looking back at all of that, I, I, it, I can't believe it happened. But you were a participant. You were there. Yeah, I, I, I nice. just, I didn't think much about it. That I only, I couldn't tell you whether it was Saturday or Sunday or Tuesday. I didn't care. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's, looking back at my life, I just think that I was blessed. Yes. Somehow I got through all of that, and I, I. The only wound I got was uh, I got nicked in my wrist with a, a friend of mine who we were shooting quail and he had a shotgun <laughs> and the quail would, you know, they fly very regularly and he shot it. He got me a BB in my eye. <laughs> That's not <too laughs> the bad. only shot I ever got was right. one of my best friends' <laughs> BB. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition since you've been at Purdue quite a while? Any tradition of Purdue's that comes to mind? Do what? A Purdue tradition? Do you have a... Oh, traditions. Yeah. Any special ones? Yeah, yeah. I'm in love with um, the boys and girls that are going through our ROTC program. I always have been. But right now, Catherine, the kids know on graduation they're probably going to go into an outfit, they're going to be trained, they could wear very well end up in Baghdad or in... in somewhere in mean, the Mideast or something. And here they are getting a degree, could get a good job, it's safe, and they're putting themselves on the line, going through the military program when in graduation, chances are they're going to end up in a combat outfit. Now that to me is a real American. That's democracy. I can't do enough for those boys and girls, mm -hmm. young men and women. And in a democracy, that's what we need. That's what we need. I don't like the draft. I don't like to keep working and making pay so high that some poor guy that can't find a job finally goes in. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. In a democracy, every person who is a member has an obligation to serve the country. I feel that way. And a lot of people think I'm stiff-necked and too narrow on that. But in a democracy, there is no, in my book, there is no free ride. You pay your dues. Yeah. Whatever your skills are, and I don't mean in the military, but in a democracy, everybody should pay their, whatever they can contribute, contribute to right. it. Yeah. And a lot of people don't like me to say it. I mean, when I have friends or whatever that avoid everything, I lay on them. <laughs> I say, hey, you're in a pay, democracy, pay man. Share. You've got a, you got a responsibility here. What yeah. the hell are you doing? Because right. uh, I don't think it's right. right. In closing, any comments for the researchers that you'd like to say in summary? Anything special that you'd like to close off with? Add some notes or anything special that you'd like to say? Well, I, I, I kind of feel uh, right now I'm moving more from uh, 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 participating with industry and participating in studies for uh, specific tasks in specific industries and making projections and certain needs. I, I'm now feeling I can back off and look at the whole world. I, I can. I, I look at the environment. 
I, I, I look at uh, pollution problems in greening. I look at relations between Muslims and Christians. I, I look between haves and have-nots throughout the world, starving people and not. And those are the things now that, rather than General Motors working on this or <laughs> that, whatever, mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to go. And Dean Dennis has been wonderful. He just says, "Good, whatever, JP. Yeah. And that's, of course, I'm not getting paid, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't need it. You're, in, you're doing what you'd like. I'm, what you want I'm to. A, yeah, I right. took care of everything. Right. We're all right. Yeah. Good. And I have a wife. You didn't ask about my wife. I was going to ask about family. Well, I'm going to have to tell you. I married the sweetest, best, wonderful gal in the world. After my, I lost my first wife. She was a nurse. She had a cerebral hemorrhage while working in the hospital 20 years ago. And then I met Susan. Susan was a assistant professor in computer science. She's smart. She's smarter than I am. And um, we were going to Chicago in a bus on a computer project of some kind, and just by chance she sat next to me. And we got there, I bought her a Coke. And I thought, gee, what a sweet gal this is. And I'd been a mis widower now for some years. So when we got home, I looked her up, and she's a uh, um, divorcee, so I got to know her. But, and she was in computer science, and, and we needed each other. She has a couple of kids, I had a couple of kids. We merged. Everything worked out beautifully until one day she came to me and she said, Hun, I want to serve God. God's calling me. She was a professor of computer science here and a good one. I said, what do you like to do? She said, I'd like to go to a seminary and become a minister. I said, you better think that over good. You're, you know, she says, I have. I said, just give it another week. And she came to me and she says, yeah. So she went to the seminary. She became ordained as a minister. And she's now the assistant pastor of a good-sized church. Here in town? Here in Federated Church in town, yeah. She's still, she's a professional organist pianist. Just wonderful. In, as well as being a computer scientist, as well as being a minister. So she's busy and in good health and quite a bit younger than I am, keeps me stepping. So uh, I'm real happy about yeah, that. Very good. That's yeah. nice to hear. She's yeah. a graduate of Purdue, computer science. And then ended up staying on. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. That's nice to hear. Yeah, she's now the assistant pastor of a pretty good sized church. And uh, she teaches kids piano. She plays quite a, uh, um, about four or five uh, instruments, the organ, and the piano accordion, and the piano and guitar and whatever. She's quite, quite talented. She's smarter than I am. Quite talented then, huh? Yeah, yeah. she's smarter than I yeah. am. This, we want to thank you very much, Professor Lysak. Well, this concludes the interview. I, I, I thank I'm you. Flattered. My pleasure. I'm flattered that you had me here. Well, we're very nice. Thank you very much. I <clears throat> am flattered, and thank <clears throat> you for inviting me over.